Okay. Uh, Tana Koto Katoa, Kobuksi Tokuingawa, Itupumaya Ho, Ki Los Angeles, Enari Kotamaki Makoto, Toku Turanga Waiwa Inaene. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Boopsi, and I am from Los Angeles, but New Zealand is where I stand right now. So I just want to say thank you very much for having me, and let's get started. So basically, I'll give you a little background on Places for Good. We're a collaborative consultancy um, with a focus on community advocacy. So as a catalyst for political will. So similar to what people were talking about, Mike Lydon um, from the Street Plans, he says you can't scale what you don't permit. So we work in that with that belief of you're trying to scale up. So I'll just work with um, a few projects, which is very interesting, speaking after Kika and about um, public space. So basically we work with cities already active, active citizens that um, Rosella mentioned. So we work with schools as well. And like Louise said, um, central government, but these are some of the projects. So here, this is how it all started. We have started here on the top right with a liquor store. So our local neighborhood had a liquor store that would, had been bought in 2006 to be a public square. And in 2015, they engaged the community, my neighborhood, this is about a five minute walk from my house, and my children walk by this liquor store every day, especially before they started school. And once I found out that it was meant to be a public square, I got very active. Um, and I was working in the local restaurant, working in the schools, um, working in the neighborhood, and I'm also a teacher. So I was fascinated by the top down and how many barriers there were to create a space that citizens had paid for in 2006 to its rightful state, which was a public open space. So I started researching and that's how I got deeply involved in the tactical urbanism process. And so on the left of that is the hopeful after. And so that was the design over three years working with 254 Ponsonby Road Community Group with five active neighborhood citizens. We would drop leaflets informing everyone about the process. We created the competition. We created the venues that held 150 people to judge local architecture students on the design. And but just before COVID, we were gonna be on, in March, 2020, they were gonna vote to give us the budget that we had spent three years working really hard to get the political will um, to pay for the structure to be shifted from a liquor store to that place you see up there. Well, the three years of this process began, I really valued children's opinions. So I went back to get my master's in teaching and I work in schools now as well. And that on the left, people familiar with the University of Auckland is the faculty of education. And that took me one year to turn that white wall into that mural. And I got in a lot of trouble multiple times. It is still there up. Um, many students ask me about it because they know that we initiated it. So it was all while I was waiting to see all the barriers I would come across for this local park as a group. So I would test things out knowing that that might be if we wanted to do a mural at the liquor store, how did it come across and how did we get past that barrier? So uh, in the meantime, I did the first parklet for our group. We, we activated the corner multiple ways similar to what you've heard before from other speakers. Um, and there was no seating. So there was nowhere you could sit for about a kilometer for free. So we put one in a parking spot and the tourists sat there, the elderly sat there, children's played in that parklet. And it was just, the, that's what tactile urbanism is for, is quickly creating it. That took two hours to make and people sit in it and feel and wonder why there aren't seats where a liquor store is. So that is really, and that was us as citizens and neighborhood citizens activating the space to garner that political will to make people realize there's a need similar to what Antonio was speaking about with you just act, you do it, and hopefully they come to the party. So then the next um, slide is after that experience of hitting all those barriers in multiple ways with government, private entities, um, government owned associations, these are questions I learned to ask from my experience with the government to in the initiated, because they initiated the process. So it wasn't us saying, hey, we want to make it legal. They said, we actually own this spot. We want to see if the community still want it. And they were shocked at how much everyone was able to empower. And it's almost like they felt like they want, we felt like they wanted us to fail because um, the amount of support they gave from the beginning. But as we got momentum and we dropped all the letter boxes and moved forward, um, we learned a lot in the process and got pretty far pre-COVID. So how is the city using the existing infrastructure? Is it adapting to consider today's need? Who are the users? What will they be doing in the space? Are we designing with our most vulnerable in mind? How are people coming to the space? 
How are they walking through it? Which directions do they exit the space? And why are you doing it and for whom? So have you spent some time, like the person making those calls telling us no, no half of them had never stood in the parking lot in front of the liquor store. And they would say, no, you can't do it. No, you can't do it. I said, please just meet for a coffee. And that's another reason you do the activations because you A, can get photographs of it looking active and B, you're trying to lure government agencies in to watch an accordion player or sit in the parklet so they understand better because they're telling you no without necessarily having stood on that GPS point. And have you form quality relationships through each adaptation? So we did a couple activations and soon we now have pre-COVID all these musicians, artists, activists, volunteers who are ready when they get called to reactivate again. And that took years, but each adaptation and change, we brought them back. So that's how Places for Good formed. It has to be for good, mostly a free place and sustainable. So for a long time. So I don't, I, we as a collaborative don't take on projects unless those are the two goals that it's enjoyed for free. So the music is free, the art is free, um, the food obviously is not, but you, I don't charge, we as a community don't charge like a letting fee for our space. And so community engagement is followed by purposeful tweaks to place in order to improve the user experience. When we think of private industry, they always talk about user experience. Um, improvements are made in an incrementally staged process with the intention for more sustainable and permanent solutions and the ability for it to provide a strong sense of place ownership and pride for the humans that encounter the project. So these are all pre-COVID projects. And uh, an example on the top right is one of my favorite um, community activists. He's our local member. And whenever we change in our design, um, we got new bins on the street that he works on. He comes straight to me and says, I really like this new recycling side. It used to be just trash and now we can recycle. And we have that relationship with the people that are actually using the government paid for entity and the designers can get that feedback, which is helpful for the next iteration. And so now when we're talking post COVID, um, tactical urbanism as a crisis response, as a mobilizer for systematic change. So this is an example of this image um, drawn by Miriam Moore, who's an urban planner in Auckland. And we had worked together in other projects. And so I started helping a local iwi and we needed within 24 hours to create an image to help locals understand washing hands, two meter distancing masks, because I think visual gets the point across faster and it's multilingual. Um, so if they didn't speak any English and they only spoke Modi, Tadeo, um, they knew right away, wash hands, wear masks two meters apart. Um, so first, how do we act in crisis? What, with what purpose? And we organize, we collaborate, and the Maori word fanangatanga means foster belonging. So because we had all the energy from the projects before and those relationships, once COVID hit, we were ready as an organization and as a collaborative to keep on going. And so, for instance, people might have seen Auckland was one of the first places to add those bike lanes or those wider footpaths. And these are pictures taken um, yesterday. So if you notice that um, before it was maybe just uh, the yellow poles were on the side, now they're cement. So because we had this Auckland City Master Plan to do this before COVID, we had all the planning, all the designs, everything ready, and we just applied it with a COVID lens. And those lines to keep people distance were also to keep people left because we have a lot of um, immigrants and migrant community in the city center. So it's just that indicator of a line. So these are all these little guides that Tactile Urbanist does at a quick turnaround to guide people. So these are the entrances to our public facilities to a swimming pool. They added the little arrows um, to guide people to go through. So these were already ready to roll out. And also because Auckland did two lockdowns, I talked to the pool um, manager and those are the same supplies they used last time. So in a sustainability standpoint, because some people get worried about all the plastic or all the use you're using of tactical urbanism, all these things get stored and pulled out again or reappropriated. So you're not re rebuilding, you're trying to keep it sustainable all the time. Um, so this just similar to other speakers, the before and after. So you can obviously see that this is a pre-COVID activation, but this is the benefits you have when you've been already working in this space the before and the after. This was a local board funded, community led street party run with the school together. So they had lots of volunteers, lots of organizations all working together. Um, and so when you look at these pictures here, this just gives you an idea of how you can build your response. You can organize. Um, if you save these relationships, these students will always, they have my private email. If, if I build furniture, they're keen to sand, sand a pallet again. So you establish that relationship to get people active. 
And so I think when we're, I'll go back to the last slide. So when we're faced with a crisis, we as practitioners um, have the capacity and experience to respond accordingly. But when we go back to these ideas and respond in a system that's top down without creating and holding these relationships and keeping them so they trust you again, they come back and they um, will do it often for free, 99.9% .9 of the time, all of these activations are done for under $1,000, um, except for that massive street party when we finally, after all the litter iterations, got the political will. So it's about growing, like um, Kritika said, you grow it exponentially slowly, but it all depends post COVID, our response is about the political will. And so this, and for me as a practitioner, the quote perfectly, but it's about, it, it's a journal that was just released today, but it's about, are you generating positive emotions? Is this iteration? So obviously this is like the third iteration that Auckland Design Office, Auckland Council, Place Creative, an agency that also consults and works with um, tractable urbanism. It took them a while to iterate that. So they had the planters and then you have to think of maintenance. Do you have the budget for the maintenance um, to support those new, but they make you feel good. If it was just a bunch of orange cones, you don't feel good. But when you see that, you have more space to socially distance at the corner. It makes you feel good and um, everyone's calmer for it. And so that, um, I put that quote from that recent journal entry because that's always how it has to be for good and it feels good and it's sustainable. Um, so it's also, um, I, have, I can't see the time when I do the screen, so I wasn't sure if I used up my seven minutes, but I'll just close. Um, it's in September, it's a Mahuru Maori Language Challenge Month. So for September Maori Language Challenge, my daughter has promised to do a karakia, which is a closing or prayer, opening prayer, but it's just to just close the speaker's range and just to help calm it all down during this COVID crisis. And after working with the Maori iwi, we always had this as a closing because it just kind of, um, you can feel it and it feels good. And so I like, um, for this month, I thought I would, I, that Louise has allowed me to share this with you all, um, as have I been gifted from the school. Kia to te rangi marie, kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa punamu te maana, kia tere te karo hirohi, i mua i te huarahi, let peace be with you, let the calm be widespread, let the sea glisten like punamu, and let the shimmering summer forever dance across your path. Thank you very much for sharing your time with me today.